What do you hope will happen, not only in 1984, but for the rest of your professional life? What are your dreams? To rule the world. <laughs> there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Madonna. My boyfriend, who was in a band, teach me how to play guitar, and then I started writing songs, and then, like, singing, you know, and I was, like, wanting to be a singer. That one moment in the, in the spotlight in front of the band singing was, like, a really big high. never had more fun with anyone else, and you know it. People are so frightened of my ideas that they try to undermine my actual talent or, or any artistic value that may be in any of my work and just say, oh, she's just doing that to shock people. The truth is never far behind. You kept it I think that I'm using sex to sell myself. I think that I'm a very sexual person. It's the way I am. It's the way I've always been. Don't go for every day. I'm different every month. I'm different every year. Well, I'm older and wiser. just begun. It's like the tip of the iceberg. I have such a long journey ahead of me. And where it goes, I don't know. Hopefully closer to the truth. To induct Madonna into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Justin Timberlake. See, a strange thing happens when you're asked to induct Madonna into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. First, of course, you're overwhelmingly honored because there is and will only ever be one Madonna. But then, but then, you become aware that every single word you can possibly imagine saying about Madonna's suddenly sounds much hotter, much dirtier, and a whole hell of a lot more fun. Induct her. <laughs> Why, yes, I, I'd love to. 
With all due respect to the fine city of Cleveland, even that place sounds slightly erotic knowing that Madonna is going to be entering the hall. Tonight is a moment to pause and consider the singular impact of this woman. Madonna has changed the way our world sounded. She's changed the way our world looked. And somehow she still found time to publicly kiss at least someone who I may or may not have kissed myself. <laughs> yeah. Of course, you all know who I'm talking about, Sean Penn. <laughs> they're jokes. They're, they're jokes. Madonna hasn't become one of music's greatest stories ever told just by shocking us at regular intervals. She's done it by working harder and being smarter than everybody else. As she made MTV the place to be seen, she racked up the greatest track record in music history, 47 top 40 hits. This is a singing, dancing, writing, promoting, achieving superstar who became the biggest name on the planet the old-fashioned way. She earned it. I co-wrote and co-produced uh, half of the tracks on her new record entitled Hard Candy. And, I, and, and naturally, when I tell people that, they're always asking me what it's really like to work with Madonna. Is she the control freak that everyone says she is? And I'm gonna tell you, hell yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wanna tell a little story really quick. One day in London, I showed up to the studio and it's probably because of the freaking schedule she had us under, but I was feeling a little ill. I was feeling under the weather. And she could tell, and she said, you're not feeling too well today. And I said, no, I'm not feeling too well today. And she said, uh, well, would you like a B12 shot? We can get a B12 shot. And I was like, yeah, I would love a B12 shot. That's the first thing I thought of. And uh, I'm thinking, right, that, you know, we're going to call a doctor and he's going to make a house call. Hey, it's a B12 shot. You know? And uh, so then she proceeds to reach into her designer handbag and uh, pull a Ziploc bag of B12 syringes out. And then she looks at me with that face that she looks at people with, and she says to me, drop them. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know what you say to that, so I immediately drop my pants. And this is a true story, by the way. This, I'm not, I, I swear, I'm not making this up. She gives me the B12 shot in my ass, and uh, then she looks at me and she says, nice top shelf. And that was one of the greatest days of my life. <laughs> I guess in my own cheesy way, I got to thinking I would tell this story because I figured that's exactly what Madonna is and will continue to be for all of us. The shot in the ass when we really needed it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the world has long been full of Madonna wannabes, and I might have even dated a couple. <laughs> but there is only one Madonna. So right now, it is one of the true thrills and privileges of my life to stand on this stage and induct Madonna into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. decide what I need to recover from all my bad hairstyles in the previous video or all of Justin's innuendos. Everything he said is basically true, but I didn't say drop them. I said, pull your pants down. <laughs> okay. Just, just like to be accurate. As, I, as you know, I am a control freak. Um, it is a great honor to receive this award. And I'm grateful and appreciative for the acknowledgement that this implies. 
I have always been fortunate to have people around me who believed in me. Starting with my ballet teacher, Christopher Flynn, in Detroit, Michigan, who told me at the age of 14 that I was special, that I needed to believe in myself, that I needed to go out into the world and pursue my dreams. Those words meant everything to me because I can assure you at the time, I didn't feel special. And then there was Dan Gilroy. He lived in an abandoned synagogue in Queens with his brother, Ed. They played in a band together. I was sick of being an out-of-work dancer, so he taught me how to play guitar. I wrote my first song in that synagogue. It was called, ironically, Tell the Truth. <laughs> I remember that moment so, so vividly. I remember the hair standing up on the back of my arms, and, I'm, and, I, and I thought to myself, who just wrote that song? That wasn't me. I felt like I had been possessed by some magic. And luckily for me, I have been miraculously and continuously possessed by some kind of magic. There's a saying in the Talmud that for every blade of grass, there's an angel that watches over it and whispers, grow, grow. And I can still hear those angels whispering. And even the naysayers, the ones who said that I was talentless, that I was chubby, that I couldn't sing, that I was a one-hit wonder. They helped me too. <laughs> they helped me because they made me question myself repeatedly, and they pushed me to be better. And I am grateful for their resistance. I know that I would not be here right now without all of it, without all of you, because life, like art, is a collaboration. And I did not get here on my own. And why would I want to? There's no way that I could ever imagined that my life would unfurl as it has. In one way, it feels like a series of suddenlies. One day I was a struggling dancer in Manhattan, and then suddenly I was in a band, and I was doing gigs at CBGB's in Max's Kansas City. And, and then suddenly I met Seymour Stein hooked up to an IV drip in a hospital bed. And then suddenly I got signed to Sire Records. And then suddenly I was rolling around on the floor at the MTV Awards with my ass hanging out. What nobody knows is that I lost one of my high heels and I dove to the ground to find it, and suddenly it was a dance move. <laughs> Yikes. And then I had to go backstage and look at my manager, who was white as a ghost, freaking out and telling me I just ruined my career. What did he know? Then suddenly, I was on the stage at Madison Square Garden, and I looked out into the audience, and every girl was dressed like me. <laughs> Freak me out. <laughs> Anyways, suddenly and suddenly and suddenly, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that everything happened exactly as it was supposed to happen that I worked with the amazing people I was supposed to work with, that I traveled to the amazing places I was supposed to travel to, that I made the mistakes that I was supposed to make, that the universe would conspire to help me and guide me all the way up to this moment where I am standing in front of you. And finally, I have the chance to say thank you to so many people. To Michael Rosenblatt, I wish he was here tonight. He's the person that more or less discovered me in a nightclub in Manhattan. He told me what he was an A&R guy at Sire Records. I had no idea what an A&R guy was, but it sounded important. So I jammed my demo tape into his hand. We both did a tab of ecstasy, and then we danced the night away. <laughs> That's the truth. 
The next person I have to thank is Liz Rosenberg. I know she's also here somewhere. Now, does anybody understand the insanity of being my publicist for the last 25 years? Cut to Freddie DeMann. Another man I want to thank. The ultimate Mac Daddy manager, slick back hair, tan, smelling of expensive cologne, big desk, smoking a cigar. Yeah, he drove a Porsche. <laughs> he gave me a ride back to my hotel on that Porsche. By the time we got there, he was my manager. <laughs> And there was no monkey business, okay? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> see, he rubbed off on me. This speech was not meant to have a lot of sexual innuendos, somehow. He's bringing sexy back. Okay, I'll get you. Um, okay, so, it is while I was with Freddie that I met this incredibly cocky Israeli teenager named Guy Osiri. <laughs> he kept pestering me with his ideas. He never stopped scheming. He was relentless. And today, he is my manager. <laughs> I would also like to thank all of my fans who have stuck by me through thick and thin. God knows they've stuck by me, yes. Now be quiet. To my teachers, my friends and my family, I thank you all for facilitating this journey, which for me has only just begun, and for reminding me that I am only the manager of my talent, not the owner. But for me, it always does and it always will come back to the music. So thank you very much. I'd like to introduce another ass kicker from Michigan, Iggy Pop.
make me feel shiny and new, like a virgin being touched for the very first time. Right. 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 Right.